Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about three things that I think are really crucial to a good coaching experience. So, you know, I've been a coach for quite a while myself, uh, seven years now, pretty close to eight. And over that time, you know, it's, it's important that we remember that even if you are a coach yourself, you're still a, like a, a consumer of powerlifting, right? Like you're still a consumer of the experience that you're trying to create for people. And so when it comes to actually thinking about like, how do we start to get better results out of people? Like, how do we start to communicate to people on a, on a more meaningful level, um, give them more positive experiences? I think it's really important that we actually take a step away from the skill development sort of lens that we tend to always look at things in and actually start to address some of the more, maybe not intangible, but just just really important things to remember in a coaching experience. And so number one amongst all of those is that coaching, whether you're listening to this as, as a competitor, as a lifter, as someone that's just, you know, maybe started with a PT or coach yourself, or if you are actually a coach yourself, coaching has to be a game of give and take, right? There, there has to be this ability to actually not only give to people, but understand uh, how to clearly explain what you need. And at the same time, you can't just expect to be able to explain what you need, but never give more than that in return to other people. There, ha there has to be like a real relationship there. So my experience in working with a lot of other coaches and working with even uh, a lot of athletes too, you'll find this in, in athletes as well, is that a lot of people just really want things their way. And that is their their systems, their successes. You know, with coaches, it's like my, my system got you that success. This is the reason why you won. This is the reason why you did so well. It's because of me. And the same way with athletes, like, no, I want things a particular way because this is how I do things. This is what I need to do. This is what I know I need. And in reality, it, it has to be somewhere in the middle, right? And I, I would actually almost say, like, maybe not even in the middle because I think in the middle of those two extremes might still be a really weird and sort of disingenuous place. Maybe it just needs to be something completely different where both parties are able to set aside their egos and really just come together and think about, well, what's going to be best here to create the result that we're actually looking for? So the majority of good coaching and good coaching experiences that I've personally had uh, have been relationships of compromise and understanding, you know, knowing when to actually push, but also knowing when to pull back. You know, you, you can't just give people a really rigid framework <clears throat> and, and expect them to just exist within that and thrive within it because things are always going to come up that are going to mean that people need to maybe uh, back off for a week or two or maybe they just simply need to dial things down. You know, maybe they can't just progress linearly and, and keep going up and up and up. I think we're all sensible enough to know that at this point, but, you know, we, we still see it keep happening. So how you do this is always going to be very, like, individual uh, to how you communicate it as a coach, right? Like you need to actually think about like, what are you trying to communicate to the person in front of you? But, a, you know, a failure to just do this to anyone is a full on catastrophic failure. You know, the failure to recognize that when you work with people, it is very much a relationship and that you need to be willing to give parts of yourself to that relationship. It means becoming somewhat vulnerable as a coach, sometimes describing your frustrations as well as hearing out their frustrations. And I think that's really uh, the, the biggest thing with coaching is like people will often start to see the coach, us, as people that only ever give them critical feedback. And it creates this really adversarial relationship when it doesn't actually have to be like that. What you should often be doing as a coach is inviting your, your client, your lifter, your athlete to give you feedback too. You should be inviting them to give you feedback. Like, how are you feeling? Is, is, you know, is the communication clear? Do you feel supported? Is there anything else that you feel like you need help with right now? And really be quite open and honest about receiving those answers. And, you know, ultimately, if you're not comfortable in actually being vulnerable in any sense with other people, then you're likely going to be probably a good short-term coach that will be able to really push people very hard 
but you'll see people not stick around for very long because they don't really see much depth in the relationship. They don't really see a future with it. They don't see themselves going anywhere with it. So you'll make people strong and then they'll drop off and then they'll just leave. So remember that your ability to actually recognize this as a relationship and pull back, actually say, well, you know, I have this expectation of my own framework of coaching, but right now it's not working because this person can't handle the amount of stress that I'm throwing at them, can't handle the amount of stress that life is probably throwing at them, a combination of those two. If I continue to push here and say, no, the framework is good, this is what gets people success, and then they get crushed, then it's not a successful framework, right? A, a successful framework tells you how to think but not what to think. So again, it, it's like you you need to be able to recognize when people aren't doing well and actually have that conversation with them and be willing to pull back, which means taking your ego out of your own coaching and really focusing on the dialogues and the compromises that are going to get the best results out of your lifter at the time. Second on this list really builds off of that first point and it's something that drives me crazy. People aren't spreadsheets, Right? People aren't going to correspond to the numbers that you program for them just because you program them. Now, sometimes things are going to be fairly predictable, like you know, maybe we, we have a better understanding of what someone's going to be able to do with 50 or 60% of their 1RM as opposed to 75, 85, 90%. And that's where things start to get a little bit more uh, fuzzy. Now, personally, I don't like to use percentages to determine rep ranges what I would prefer to do is just let the percentage speak for itself. You know, this is why we always go for a mixed methodology where we're utilizing RPE and percentages. So we're taking the RPE top set, we compare that to the percentage of what that is of their, their sort of total 1RM and then use that to inform our future decision-making process. But again, that's a very like client-centric focus. That's a very ground up approach that I think is really necessary in good powerlifting coaching, good strength coaching. But again, at best, you can only ever estimate, you can only ever guess how people are going to respond to a certain stimulus on a certain week. And even if people have <clears throat> three very good weeks, three very, very good weeks, you also need to understand that as a coach, it probably means that the fourth week has a reduced likelihood of being good, not an increased one. And that's, that's where like experience in coaching starts to come in because you you know that people just can't ride you know stay on the ride forever eventually the ride stops and you have to get off so normally if you have quite a few good weeks strung together it means you, you're probably due for a dip and that's again not a solid strategic framework it's it's just true and experience so again like your job as a coach is to recognize patterns right your, your job as a coach is to recognize patterns and that's what i'm saying is like i've been able to recognize that pattern in a lot of my lifters that i've worked with so, okay, we get like three good weeks and maybe this lifter drops off at week four. Maybe this lifter drops off at week five, six, seven, you know, but you, you need to pay attention to those things rather than just giving them a spreadsheet and expecting them to always be able to correspond to that. So again, your job is not only to, I guess, see patterns, but be able to just interpret the information that they're giving you, not only in terms of what the what's happening with the um lifts but what's happening with the difficulty of the set what kind of language are they using to describe how they're feeling you know oh man i feel really busted up i feel really beat up or no i feel great you know everything's good or you know mm, i'm feeling a little tight a little sore like all of those things can mean different things for different people and it's really like your job to be able to read between the lines there and that's not something that this sort of like fixed spreadsheet mindset allows you to do it's just like Here's the numbers, go do them, and and that's it. Just like make it happen somehow. And I, I just find that that's a, a, it's a really sort of naive um, way of looking at coaching. Of course, like this works both ways too, right? Like it does prevent overreaching, but what it may also do is encourage appropriate levels of effort when it's programmed effectively. So, you know, when you're actually looking at this, you're like, okay, I'm trying to get people away from the spreadsheet mindset and I'm trying to take a more client-centric focus. It's going to feel like you're a little bit cut adrift as a coach to start with because you're probably very used to just being like numbers-driven. 
And we have to also understand that, you know, a 5% increase per week might be okay when your 1RMs are like 100 kilos, but when your 1RMs are closer to 300 kilos, that 5% increase week to week is actually huge. So again, it's like, how do we start to look at this as being a more effective system? It's probably by, you know, just building in more flexibility into it and just taking into account that although we program four weeks at a time, we're only ever programming based on assumptions. What we're trying to do is interpret the information that we're given week to week and actually adjust based on that. It's also important to remember that people are emotional and they have valid emotional needs, right? That, that not only need to be acknowledged, but they need to be factored into any kind of meaningful training program. And the relationship that you are able to build with your clients by acknowledging those emotional needs and knowing that they probably will affect their training is going to determine a greater level of long-term success than your bloody spreadsheet ever will, right? You just actually taking the time to listen to your clients, listen to your lifters, support their decisions and, and sort of back their decision-making processes, guarantee it, like building that trust and building that relationship with them will not, it's not just about keeping people on, right? It's about giving them better results, but the better the relationship is, the better is the results are, just full stop. Now, number three, finishing off here, people don't actually want numbers or education. I know that this is a really weird thing coming from me because I tend to over-intellectualize, but it, it is definitely something that I'm coming to get used to now. And that's a, we all have a habit of over-intellectualizing because we belong, like we as coaches, right? We belong to this like subculture and that subculture within it we all speak our own language. And so we're all talking to each other about RPE and RIR and percentages and intensities and relative intensities and bar load and this and that. When in reality, we forget that the majority of people, including our own clients, don't actually belong to that subculture and that we might as well be speaking a completely different language because for all intents and purposes, we are. And while you might so deeply think that those details matter because they matter within the subculture, in the broader context of where people live and exist, they just don't, right? They're, they're just not as important. And it doesn't mean that they're not important to progress, but it just means maybe they're not that important to what you communicate to people. So note that I said like people, it, it's that they don't care, not that they don't understand, right? I think that this is one of the the sort of pitfalls in in having this discussion about this topic. It's like, people conflate the idea of not understanding with not caring. And it's just, you know, most, most of your clients will understand. Like if you actually sat down and you took the time to explain them, explain to them this stuff, they would understand. But I don't think that would actually affect their ability to hit a lift. I don't think that would actually affect their ability to show up or manage their stress externally better. You know, it wouldn't affect the argument that they had at work. It wouldn't affect the deadline that they have at uni. Like it wouldn't affect any of that stuff. So it's it's not that it's unimportant. It's just only important to you, okay? And so we really have to remember the context and the subculture in which we live when we're actually communicating to people about things that are meaningful. So remember that, you know, your, your clients, like they themselves and everyone really, like we, we all live in our own like internal worlds and you're the, the internal world of your client has nothing to do with your internal world. So remember that it's like, what do I actually have to communicate to this person right now to get them the best possible results? It's probably not going to be a bunch of, of jargon and, and, you know, coaching methodology and stuff like that. Like you love it, honestly love it, immerse yourself in it, live that but also understand that it's not the same way that you communicate meaningfully. So your clients care, what they care about is how you use those tools to solve their problems, right? They don't care about the tool itself in the same way that no one actually cares about what kind of hammer you use to you know, hammer a nail into the wall. What they actually care about is what their framed photo looks like when it hangs in their living room. And they're going to remember that you were the person that created that experience for them. They're not going to care about the, the bloody claw hammer model that you used. They're going to care about the fact that you helped them do something, right? That's what we need to be focusing on. So just avoid that desire to actually over-intellectualize and educate. Like educate through empowerment, 
right? Educate by showing how you solve issues, but don't educate by just going into the weeds of programming methodology. It's just not very effective. Instead, focus on the experience that you're actually trying to create for the people that you work with. If you focus on that experience, like what do they need to hear right now? What do they need to feel right now? What do they need from me? If you can start to combine those two skill sets along with everything else that we've talked about today, you're going to be really, really doing well. So that's it. I hope uh, you enjoyed this list here. Uh, let me know if there's any other topics that you want to be hearing from. I do have a couple that are in the works from people that have submitted some ideas already. But as always, leave them in the comments below and I will talk to you soon. Cheers.